This episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by Stitch Fix and by HelloFresh. Hello! The most unexpected and unusual tech saga of the year continues to evolve at a breakneck pace that is hard to even keep up with without getting a little bit of whiplash. Yeah. Just a week ago, we learned that OnlyFans, the internet's premier destination for artisanal, free-range, yeah. homemade pornography, was uh, making moves to break into the mainstream via a new app called OFTV, which features video content by some of OnlyFans' top creators, but in a non-sexually explicit way. Yes, These are safe, safe for work, work videos. Yes. Uh, basically, it's your favorite naked people, but they've got clothes on, or at least, I don't know, bathing suits, and they're doing talk shows and cooking shows and fitness shows. And unlike OnlyFans' main site, OFTV is available on the Apple and Google app stores, which prohibit pornographic content. Yeah, so... That was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, interesting idea. Good for See you. See how it goes, yeah. yeah. Uh, this was seen as OnlyFans' first step towards some sort of transition from being Patreon of porn into just being another Patreon, which at first glance seemed like a decent idea, though not exactly necessary, and wasn't actually sure to succeed on its own. A risky move. Can a brand primarily known for porn successfully expand into being a brand open to all content? Including porn? Well, before anyone really had much time to contemplate this question, uh, OnlyFans threw one hell of a curveball. They were going to ban sexually explicit content. And they were going to do it just over a month from now. Uh, the immediate reaction from basically everyone, especially the OnlyFans users, whom OnlyFans built its entire success off of, was, Hold on, what the fuck? Why would the website known exclusively for its sexually explicit content decide to ban sexually explicit content? And it's so funny, looking back at those golden days of one week ago, <laughs> when we were talking about the fact that it would be possible for OnlyFans to get away with showing SF or SFW, safe for work content, yeah. because the name isn't yeah. explicitly like tied to pornography. If any porno site was gonna be able to do it, this would be the one. They have all the infrastructure in place to do non-pornographic The hosting. name could Only pass. Fans. fans of anything. Yeah. Fans yeah. of porn, fans of, I don't know, uh, model trains. Yeah, it could, yes, it could be anything. That's how I get my rocks off, um, model trains. The bigger, the, the, the better. Well, not for me. I like the, the, the miniatures. The, the detail that goes Petite. into a good miniature model train set is really something to behold. And these typically... 50 to 75 year old white males put a lot of time into their model train sets and look. I like my model trains barely legal. They got paint, <laughs> leaded paint from way back when that is not. Uh, I like code. the big old locomotives. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the next day after that was when they said uh, no more explicit content and then our uh, attitude shifted to this is what Tumblr did and immediately died of. Yeah. Um, and now, even even in that episode, we were like, and this could change by the time this episode goes up. It did take a few days, but the story has changed again, damn it. Yeah. And the short answer as to why the hell they would do such a baffling uh, abrupt, thing. Abrupt, yeah. Uh, is that the banks and the credit card companies have been pressured by right-wing anti-porn crusaders to stop doing business with porn websites. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, we should point out that the proposed ban on sexually explicit content that everyone was like, what the fuck is this? It actually has a lot more nuance than it sounds. Basically, nudity would still be allowed, but Real or simulated sex, real or simulated masturbation, close-ups on genitals and anuses, and sexual body bodily fluids, those would all be banned. Well, I mean, at that point, it's really just Playboy. I mean, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that, but like, it, I do think likely a majority, or at least a pretty strong plurality of OnlyFans' content that's hosted there probably would be in the clear. I feel like most of these women are just posting lewds, they're not like getting railed and shit. Although, I don't know. I'm not the person to ask. If yeah, you're I, an OnlyFans subscriber, why don't you let us know down in the comments uh, what your, uh, the people you patronize with your money yeah, is it, provide as a service. On a scale from, uh, I don't even want to put non-nude on it because that shouldn't be on the scale. The scale would be tasteful, tastefully naked yeah. versus uh, ex like very extreme. On a scale of one to 10, uh, if you are an only, make a fake account if you want, uh, <laughs> but tell us where on the scale uh, the majority of what you yeah. consume is. Because the impression I get is that 
there is tons of like explicit content, but like I feel like most of it's just people trying to make a few extra bucks during during a pretty bad time uh, for employment. Yeah, and so they're posting a titty, they're posting a butt cheek, <laughs> but I might be wrong. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, regardless of whether that's the case, creators pretty credibly fear that these new rules, even if they are technically following them, yeah. would just be the first step on a slippery slope towards even more censorship. And also, they might be the kind of thing where the enforcement of it is uh, going to be kind of like the enforcement of rules on YouTube, and it will result in false flags and other headaches for creators that yeah. they don't want. Yeah, it's uh, it would be a lot of work to police this so strictly, and uh, a lot of uh, reports coming in from people who, for whatever reason, decided to not... Do it accurately, and uh, that costs OnlyFans even more money yeah. because they have to hire people. It's just a headache for everyone. Yeah. Uh, but back to why this is happening, or was happening, or might still happen, and we'll get to that. But it's the banks and credit card companies not wanting to process transactions for adult content. The finance sector has always had a weirdly puritanical relationship with the seedier sides of the economy, but especially in the past few years following some really fucked up revelations about Pornhub hosting revenge porn, underage porn, and porn that they knew was created under false pretenses. Yeah, that shit was bad. Mm -hmm. Not gonna argue with that. No. Um, but in the wake of that, companies like MasterCard have imposed new rules for porn sites that want to process payments with them, like age verification, content review, and a speedy complaint resolution and appeals process, which are all very sensible solutions. Mm -hmm. And sites like OnlyFans are abiding by those rules, but it doesn't matter because despite that, several banks are still choosing to simply not do business with porn sites at all. Just Save, them, save themselves the trouble. Yeah. They're just not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, OnlyFans' founder and CEO, Tim Stokely, confirmed that this was the case in an interview with the Financial Times, naming three major banks who were flagging and rejecting all OnlyFans transactions due to reputational risk. But like we said at the top of this video, the story keeps changing. In just a week, we have gone from OnlyFans expanding beyond sexually explicit content, fine, to OnlyFans banning sexually explicit content, upsetting everyone, to OnlyFans announcing that this was all a false alarm. It was a good false alarm, everyone. Don't worry. You can get your porn and Rooney. On Wednesday morning, the official OnlyFans Twitter account posted, thank you to everyone for making your voices heard. <laughs> we have secured assurances necessary to support our diverse creator community and have suspended the planned October 1 policy change. OnlyFans stands for inclusion and we will continue to provide a home for all creators. Even the freaky ones. Yeah, especially the freaky ones. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so far, that's kind of all they've really said, yeah. at least as of when we're filming this. And it's I, been like almost 24 hours since they released that statement. Again, the stipulation is, though, that this, by the time this video goes up or that you watch it, yeah, it probably could have changed be. again. Yeah, this we can't keep up with the story. Mm -hmm. We're like... Uh, Loving it, though. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of stuff happening. Great content. Yes. Uh, well, not for YouTube's algorithm so much. <laughs> yeah. Probably going to get demonetized just by mentioning OnlyFans, even though we're reporting on it in a uh, a, a journalistic way. No, in the, in the tags, you got to put only space fans. Never combined. I'm sure Never combined. Work. That's a pro gamer trick. Hacker man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it sounds like OnlyFans has managed to negotiate some kind of arrangement with the banks. It's unclear, but that we would assume that something like that has happened. No, they saw the news and they were like, wait, two billion dollars? What are you doing? No, turn it down. Turn it back on. Wait, you make how much money? Well, I mean, we didn't want it, but now it's that much. Yeah. Hmm. That's a lot of fees. That is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's also unclear whether this is a for now thing or a for good thing. Yeah. That's kind of up in the air. What is clear, though, is that OnlyFans creators are still rightfully really, really angry with OnlyFans for the stress of this past week and the stress that still remains kind of hanging over all this. Yeah. And their trust in the platform has definitely been eroded. Uh, most of the replies I saw from OnlyFans creators to the announcement that they were not going to be implementing this policy on October 1st were, fuck you! Yeah. Even though they're happy about this, but it's still just like, fuck you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this has been a, a real yeah, rough week This for has creators. been a very rough week. Yeah. And uh, another thing that seems pretty clear here is that the amount of public outcry about this from people with no real connection to the adult industry or OnlyFans probably played at least a small part in this policy reversal. This was wildly unpopular yeah. uh, among the mainstream, which was interesting. 
Yeah, which is g good. Yeah, yeah. Because it, yeah. It's a, this is a positive thing that like happens. with Pornhub, you could point to just a fucking laundry like, look, list. Look at all the things that are fucked up. Here. Yeah, but like, I mean, I'm sure OnlyFans is probably it, not without yeah, its uh, yeah. cause for alarm in I'm, some cases. I'm sure. I'm sure, but, but the like, general consensus seems to be pretty supportive. Yeah. Of this uh, service. Yeah. Which is, we come a long way, baby. Yeah, I, we'll take the wins where we get them because America and the UK, where they're based, still very like regressive with a lot of uh, certain things. Yeah, which is funny because like every major financial institution in the US and Europe has like some real big skeletons in their closet. Yeah! <laughs> like funding, not even in their closet, like, out in the open. Yeah, just like funding death squads yeah. in countries. Like, like oh getting, god. Oh, she spread her butthole open. Like they've oh, all. We can't have that on the ledger. Every fucking bank at some point has like accidentally done business with like cartels and like yeah. organized crime and shit. But oh no, pornography. Yeah, why not take the money from someone paying to see a woman clamp her nipples? Yeah, but at the very least, OnlyFans they they fucked around and they definitely found out yes. that their prospects for running any kind of business, explicit or non-explicit, were not looking too good in the wake of all this negative attention from the creators and customers who got them where they are in the first place. The people that they literally built their empire on the backs of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it so far seems like this has worked itself out, but I guess we'll I mean see. they had to have realized that this was their only business. Yeah. They should start a, a company called Only Business. We identify what your exact purpose is, and then if you stray from it, we tell you that your business is going to well, be I'd like to sell products that keep people cool in their homes during the summer months. Uh, we sell uh, air conditioners, swamp coolers, uh, but most of our business is uh, fans, <laughs> ceiling fans. Uh, you say you know, only fans. So I, well, I'm thinking only fans. That's all we sell. We don't sell anything else. It's only fans. I'm developing a product. It's a very comfortable device. It's stuffed. It's wrapped. And uh, I call it the pillow, except my wife loves it so much she tries to take it all the time. So I say, no, my that's, pillow. That's my pillow. My pillow. Yeah, and you're going to be saying that's my but pillow. But I got a new idea, and it's uh, it's putting all of our business money into proving that the election was a fraud. <laughs> Do you think that's a good business move? No. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, anyways, Mo uh, yeah. Moving on now to an update to uh, an ongoing, extremely long-running saga that we have been waiting to hear news about for a long time now. Uh, the slow and steady wheels of American justice seem to finally be catching up with Jacob Wool and Jack Berkman, the two most ambitious and least successful political grifters in modern history. Wool and Berkman's constant pathological dishonesty has plunged them into a spiral of self-destruction that has alienated them from all of their former political allies and gotten them almost completely deplatformed off the internet. But now it's looking like it also might cost them a fuckload of money. Yeah, it's impossible to recap Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman's long history of telling easily disproved lies about perceived enemies of former President Donald Trump. But it mostly consisted of press conferences at hotels and in Jack Berkman's driveway, where they would try and fail to get the press interested in absurd, often sexually explicit stories about people like Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, and Robert Mueller. Uh, but this literal slander isn't what got them in trouble. Amazingly, yeah. What got them in trouble were robocalls sent to thousands of voters in predominantly black and brown parts of the country before the 2020 election, with automated messages featuring disinformation intended to dissuade people from voting by mail. Yeah, well, actually, more specifically, what got them in trouble was that those robocalls literally name-dropped Wool and Berkman as the people responsible for the calls, and the caller ID for the calls was literally Jack Berkman's phone number. Yeah, I did it. Whoops! Uh, so, yeah, it's it's this is all ridiculous enough that for just about anyone else, you could safely at least question whether this was the work of, you know, someone else that was done in a way to, like, frame Wool and Berkman for this crime. What kind of idiot? would just leave the evidence right there in the open. But with these guys, it seems entirely like something they would actually yeah, do. Didn't, wasn't there a time when like uh, Wall was using his mom's home landline number for yeah, something? Yeah, they at least have a history of like trying and failing, but trying to be sneaky about their stuff. But like in this but one- like, was, like only one step removed. Yeah, but in this one, they're just like, hey- So what's your last name? Hey, this is, this is Jack Berkman and Jacob Wall, and we're yeah. about to do some election interference. We're gonna break some laws. I'm surprised he never got caught up with that filing a false report thing. That seemed like the time 
But that was uh, like some small town shit. Police departments, they don't like having. Uh, he's already gone. They like that would require like an investigation and court. Police departments like easy shit. Uh, yeah. Like right. just arresting people for having petty drugs. Crime. Yeah, petty crime. <laughs> they like petty crime. Broken windows. Yeah, had a successful day tonight. Yeah. Anyway, so Wall and Berkman were indicted on criminal charges in Michigan and Ohio. Those add up to potentially decades in prison if they're convicted. And they're facing civil suits from the state of New York and the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, which adds up to a lot of money. Yeah, and now on top of all of that, the Federal Communications Commission has announced that they plan to fine Wall and Berkman $5.1 million. The largest fine that the FCC has ever issued for violating the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Uh, so let's read from the FCC's official press release on the matter. The FCC's Enforcement Bureau investigation found that the calls in this case were apparently pre-recorded and made to consumers' wireless phones without the required prior consent. Subject to narrow exceptions, the TCPA prohibits making pre-recorded voice calls to wireless phones without the consent of those receiving the calls, regardless of the content of the calls. The robocalls in this case, made on August 26th and September 14th, 2020, used messages telling potential voters that if they vote by mail, their, quote, personal information will be part of a public database that will be used by police departments to track down old warrants and be used by credit card companies to collect outstanding debts. The commission began its investigation following consumer complaints and concerns raised by a nonprofit organization. It continues, the Enforcement Bureau worked with the Ohio Attorney General's Office to identify two dialing service providers that provided subpoena responses confirming the robocall campaigns and identifying the clients who had hired them for this service. The Bureau used the subpoenaed call records and recordings of the calls to determine that the calls apparently went to wireless phones and the message was pre-recorded. The consumers who agreed to speak with the Bureau about the calls confirmed they had not provided prior consent to the callers. The subpoenas also produced email exchanges between the dialing service vendors and Wall and Berkman about the call campaigns, including choosing which zip codes to target and the tape we want to go out, quote. The calls themselves identified Wall and Berkman by name and used Berkman's wireless phone number as the caller ID. Wall and Berkman also both admitted under oath to their involvement in the creation and distribution of the robocalls, with Berkman stating in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, quote, that is our call, yes, yes, with confirmation <laughs> from Wall. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Wall and Berkman presumably can appeal this in some way, but it's such a clear-cut, slam-dunk case by two guys who have been playing with fire for a very long time that it is probably, hopefully, safe to say that their finances are, at the very least, in serious jeopardy. They will never recover financially. They're going to be flying Frontier from now on. Yeah. Uh, if this were any other conservative grifters, we'd assume that some mega donor would swoop in and help them to pay off the fines. But again, these guys have managed to alienate just about every possible ally they ever they had. They don't have friends. And again, this is really just a surprise $5.1 million fine on top of all the other yeah, stuff. Yeah, I didn't even know the FCC was involved in this at all. Yeah, just like, sort of by the way, <laughs> yeah. th this is also happening. Yeah. And that potentially adds up to even more fines and several years in prison. Jacob Wall and Jack Berkman are officially, ring the bell everyone, in deep shit. And it's a long time coming. It's a very long time coming. And also, uh, speaking of Wall and Berkman, a few months back, the YouTube channel Okie's Weird Stories published a very well-produced video documenting their whole insane saga. Uh, and a few weeks back, uh, he published part two. So it, it adds up to basically a feature-length two-hour documentary about Wool and Berkman that touches on a lot of details that even we missed. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's probably the definitive timeline of their bullshit, uh, though now it's looking like there's going to need to be a part three at some point in the next year yeah. or so when all these legal matters from the robocalls are finally resolved. But yeah, if you want, I, if you, if you want to go down memory lane and uh, see a succinct uh, two-hour version of the, the Wool Berkman story, Oki's Weird Stories is where to go with that. There you go. Uh, anyways, we do, in fact, have more news coming up for you. But first, a word from this week's sponsor, starting with Stitch Fix. Shopping for new clothes can be time-consuming, tedious, and expensive. Fortunately, Stitch Fix makes it easy to find the clothes you love. Stitch Fix offers clothing hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. Every piece is chosen for your fit and your life, and it's the easy solution to finding what makes you look and feel your best. 
Try on pieces at home before you buy, keep your favorites, and send back the rest. Stitch Fix has free shipping, easy returns and exchanges, and a prepaid return envelope is included. There's no subscription required. Try Stitch Fix once or set up automatic deliveries. You'll pay just a $20 styling fee for each box, which gets credited towards pieces you keep. And there are no hidden fees ever. Stitch Fix has styles and clothing to fit any occasion for women, men, and kids. They ship all over the U.S. and the U.K. as well. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash newsday, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That is stitchfix.com slash newsday for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. stitchfix.com slash newsday. Hey, this episode is also sponsored by HelloFresh. Hello. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip the trips down to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. Well, that's why it's America's number one meal kit. <laughs> what we love most about HelloFresh is the variety. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, from vegetarian meals and calorie smart choices to extra special gourmet options. There's something for everyone to enjoy with recipes designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. HelloFresh is also a great value. It's over 30% cheaper than shopping at grocery stores with pre-portioned ingredients that ensure you won't spend money on excess food that just ends up going in the trash. We're both big fans of all the different twists on burger and taco recipes that HelloFresh offers, and those gourmet options. Mm, I feel like a king looking through that app, mm -hmm. choosing if I'm going to have a little, maybe uh, treat myself with some lobster and steak this week on yeah, HelloFresh. Surf Fresh. and turf. Yeah. Uh, you'll never run out of fun and delicious new takes on these seemingly simple meals. Uh, coming up in the first week of September, they've got one pan Southwest shrimp tacos and mozzarella stuffed caprese burgers, both of which Look very delicious. Mm. Uh, start having fun in the kitchen like we are by going to HelloFresh.com slash Newsday14 and using the code Newsday14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that is up to 14 free meals by going to HelloFresh.com slash Newsday14 and using that code Newsday14. Back to the news now. <laughs> Uh, the 2020 U.S. election was a big deal for obvious reasons, but here in California, it also featured a very controversial ballot measure called Proposition 22. Uh, Proposition 22 was a response to recent California laws that tightened up the definitions of employee and independent contractor and basically told a lot of companies in the gig economy that they could no longer classify their workers as contractors and would instead have to treat them as employees with all of the benefits and protections that that entails. Uber and Lyft, of course, vowed to fight this new law tooth and nail, first by threatening to leave California altogether, then by funding Prop 22. Ballot measures are, in theory, a great way to allow for direct democracy, with voters deciding on laws instead of elected officials. Turns out voters are dumb, though. <laughs> but in practice, what can happen is that companies like Uber and Lyft can spend over $200 million on ads and billboards and mailers to essentially trick voters into signing off on a law that they essentially wrote themselves. Yeah. Meanwhile, the uh, the yes on or the no on Prop 22 campaign Please. Sp spent like 15 million dollars. Just like, a guy handing out buttons. Hey, I don't know, man. I saw a billboard and a TV ad and a radio ad and someone put something in my door saying I should vote for Prop 22. So you got to spend more money. Yeah, I'm real gullible. <laughs> it takes a lot of marketing to get to this guy. I believe the last thing I was told at any given time. You know, at least we're not, we're, we're so gullible that it takes $200 million to really convince everyone. I might be dumb, but you're going to have to <laughs> pay gonna, some money. It's going to cost you. <laughs> uh, and to be clear, there were plenty of rideshare drivers who supported Prop 22, though it's unclear whether they supported it based on a clear understanding of the facts. Yes. Uh, based on... A lot of the pro on uh, yes on 22 driver testimonies I saw, it seemed they were uh, maybe given a very skewed perspective on what all of this meant. You're going to lose your job if you vote for this. Yeah, essentially that. Uh, Uber and Lyft, they did a whole lot of fear mongering about negative things that would happen to the driver's livelihoods if it didn't pass. Basically, you're going to lose your job. You like having kids? Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take your children. <laughs> Uh, they also similarly fear-mongered about what would happen to riders. Every time you opened up the goddamn apps, you had to, you had a, a big yes on 22 screen that you had to click yeah. out of. And yeah, they were like, the rides are going to get more expensive. The meal delivery is going to get more expensive. And you know what? 
All that propaganda, it worked. Prop 22 passed, but guess what? Rides with Uber and Lyft are still significantly more expensive than they were a year ago. Like almost to an insane degree. It like, is outrageous like I the knew, amount. Of, yeah. I knew they were lying, but I'm still shocked at how much more expensive it is to ride now. I can guarantee, guarantee that all, at least once someone has had a little too much to drink at a bar and they're like, ah, it. not driving tonight, pulling up the like, $50. I, know. It's I just, guess I'll risk it. I know. Like, yeah, it's uh. <laughs> Yeah, well, the problem is, is like, we, we shouldn't have ever been so easy to have to rely on uh, companies like Uber and Lyft and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, public transit should have been expanded. This problem or all started. Taxis uh, being terrible. Uh, this all started a uh, hundred years ago when all the tire companies bought the rail lines and privatized them in California and shut them down. I mean, yeah, that's true <laughs> for our city specifically, yeah. but America is also completely built the wrong way for yeah. any kind of proper public transit. It's true. Cities were built wrong. They, built different. They literally, I saw the funniest. Here in America, our cities are built different. I saw the funniest picture recently. It's like a artist mock-up of like what Paris would look like if they uh, built it like Houston. <laughs> and there's just like freeways going around the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> 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 yeah. The first time I ever like saw the, shit. The first time I ever saw the uh, Statue of Liberty was like on a highway. Yeah. It ain't right. Yeah, and roads take up a lot of space. <laughs> Especially because uh, because of roads, they create their own problem because everyone has to have a fucking car to get anywhere. Yeah. Uh, it sucks. And uh, we shouldn't have to rely on them, but uh, we were literally asleep at the wheel for a while. Yeah. Asleep in the back seat. But, um, yeah, I guess, I guess Uber and Lyft flat out lied. Seems that way. Uh, to get Prop 22 passed. But despite the fact that ballot measures can technically only be repealed via another ballot measure. Last week, a judge found that Prop 22 was unconstitutional and unforceable. Oh, cool. And he struck it from the books. Here's The Verge. California Superior Court Judge Frank Roche ruled Friday that the law illegally, quote, limits the power of a future legislature to define app-based drivers as workers subject to workers' compensation law, adding that the entirety of Proposition 22 is unenforceable. He also ruled that it was unconstitutional that the law required any future amendments to have a seven-eighths vote of approval to pass the legislature. In January, a group of Uber and Lyft drivers, along with the SEIU, filed a lawsuit seeking to have the measure overturned. The law exempts gig employers from providing benefits and protections to workers, but requires that they offer health care subsidies and minimum hourly earnings. Roche took issue with the part of the law that requires any future California state law concerning collective bargaining for gig workers to comply with the Prop 22 law. Quote, it appears only to protect the economic interests of the network companies in having a divided, ununionized workforce, which is not a stated goal of the legislation, he wrote. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it sounds like they might be able to take it down on a technicality of just being too damn Which would broad. be hilarious because then they would have completely wasted $200 million that they could have used for health care and wages for their workers. I mean, that was the whole thing, like, while this was going down, it was like, it's like, oh, we can't afford, you know, we're so, ugh, we just don't have the cash to like pay for everyone to be a full-time employee. And like, you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars like on a vanity law. Yeah. Like, and it would also, sounds like you got the money. It would also take a lot of the bite out of the increased cost for it, knowing that your driver could get could see a doctor whenever they wanted to yeah. or put food on their table. Yeah, now you ride it, it sucks. It's like fucking $50 to go five miles uh, and the driver has no insurance or anything. Or they just don't show up. Yeah, it's it's bad. Yeah. They also, like, less people actually want to work for them now, which well, yeah. makes uh, absolutely makes sense. Why would you? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Uber and Lyft, they are, of course, appealing the ruling. They don't want their $200 million <laughs> going to waste. They spent good money on that law, yeah. and they want that law to stay. And uh, Prop 22 will likely remain in effect during the appeals process, which will take at least a few months and... Uh, how this will turn out in the end is really anyone's guess. There's been a seismic shift over the last decade or so in the way a lot of jobs just work, and labor law has a lot to catch up on. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, just the amount of the workforce that is contractors today compared to 10, 15 years ago, it's fucking staggering. And we thought it was bad back then. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Crazy. Anyways, let's move on to some uh, very dumb COVID news. And no, we're not going to rehash how god awful things are right now with the spread of COVID nineteen. Except that 
It is horrible, and this current wave of cases looks like it'll easily surpass the historic peak in January very soon. But let's instead make fun of some very stupid anti-vaxxers who thought they were being smart, but instead easily were caught breaking the law. Yeah, in the most pointless way possible, mm -hmm. too. So right now, the state of Hawaii, they really do not want people from the mainland coming over on vacation. Well, like, they never really did, but now specifically. But now specifically, yeah. And uh, one of the ways they're trying to at least prevent people from just bringing COVID to the islands is by requiring visitors to either provide proof of vaccination or a negative test result from within the past 72 hours. It's not nothing, but uh, yeah, seems like really no big deal even for people who aren't vaccinated, who are completely opposed to it. Just get the test. Yeah, and, there you go. And come to Hawaii. But one family visiting from Miami decided to make things a little bit harder for themselves. Here's NBC Miami. A couple from Miami Beach was arrested in Hawaii last week after police say they attempted to use fake vaccination cards to travel into the island for a family vacation. Enzo Del Mazo, 43, and Daniela Del Mazo, 31, were charged with falsifying a vaccine card, with Daniela facing an additional two counts for submitting fake documents for their two children, according to complaints filed by the Hawaii Attorney General's Office. Court documents show the couple was arrested on August 11th after an airport screener became suspicious about the children's vaccine cards due to their age. The two kids were born in 2016 and 2017 and are too young to have been inoculated with any of the three vaccines currently approved for emergency use in the U.S. A little too clever they were being, Sam. So yeah, just so we're clear. No, 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 we're so good yeah. that we even went above and beyond and snuck a few vaccines in for the kids. Yeah, so just, just to reiterate, uh, the parents' own fake vax cards is not what tipped the screeners off. No. They may have well have gotten away with all this. Probably would have. Uh, what tipped off the screeners was the fact that the couple's four-year-old and five-year-old had their own vaccine cards, despite the fact that they'd have to be at least 12 years old to have gotten the vaccine based on how the vaccine rollout has gone. Mm -hmm. And if you're a person that looks at vaccine cards all day, every day at the airport, uh, if you see a tiny child... For the first for time the first in time, weeks where you're just like, like, wait, hold on. Well, that's unusual. I'm going to stop and look into this a little more closely. Yeah. Anyway, that entire uh, family's entire vacation, their entire Hawaii vacation that they've probably been looking forward to for months was ruined. They were arrested. They were sent to jail. They were fined a total of $8,000. And all this could have been avoided by simply getting tested for COVID within three days of their flight. Had to go and make things more complicated than they needed to be. Yeah, I like playing life on hard mode. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to an update about Activision Blizzard versus the uh, California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which centers on a mountain of allegations about harassment and discrimination towards female employees. And California has now expanded the lawsuit, alleging that Activision Blizzard has been withholding and suppressing evidence related to the lawsuit, and apparently in some cases uh, attempting to destroy it or Just, actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Allegedly. Uh, here's Axios. The DFEH also says Activision Blizzard has stymied its efforts through NDAs, requiring employees to speak with the company ahead of contacting the DFEH and its involvement with Wilmer Hale, a law firm the game maker said will investigate misconduct issues. The suit claims that this directly interferes with DFEH's ability to investigate, prosecute, and remedy workplace discrimination and harassment violations on behalf of employees and contingent or temporary workers. It alleges in part that documents related to investigations and complaints were shredded by human resources personnel in violation of what it asserts is the game company's legal obligation to retain them pending the investigation. Like in a fucking movie. Ooh, that's, you, you, you don't want to get caught doing that. No, uh, well, that's, yeah, it's generally something you don't want to get accused of uh, by a government agency that's already suing you for something you spent, or they spent years investigating, so, oops. Uh, seems like that would just make them go after you even more aggressively than they already are. But we probably uh, should just cooperate. Much like the Hawaii couple, bold strategy. Not sure it's going to pay off, but bold nonetheless. Probably not. Probably um, not. Yeah, well, well, we'll obviously keep monitoring this situation because it is national fucking news. It was crazy The uh, because Activision is releasing like a new Call of Duty game. Uh, it's a World War II or something like yeah. that. And like in, the, in one of the, like, the write-ups that I saw... It made a point. I, 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 I don't know where I said it. it was like Kotaku or it could have been any of the Polygon or whatever. But they made a point specifically in it to be like, no one that worked directly on this game had been accused of anything in the Activision Blizzard lawsuit. 
it's like good, like, I like guess. this game, like the stamp, like it's this is organic. This is an organic, ethically sourced. I mean, game. The people who will make the most money off this game definitely uh, knew about and looked the other way about. Yeah, I just thought it was it was a very stuff. odd like paragraph yeah. in the middle of an otherwise. Just so we're clear, uh, I know this is an Activision game, the Rape Company, but <laughs> we have nothing to do with that. Yes. Just so we're clear. Looks like a great game, though. I had no idea this was going to happen uh, because there was like every year Call of Duty comes out, but like with the pandemic and all that, and they've yeah. got their still very successful Battle Royale game that people complain about but still play. I love it. And uh, yeah, this was like, oh, hey, cool. This looks interesting. I'll have to, you know, look the other way on some stuff that Activision's been doing. But uh, after all, why shouldn't I? <laughs> um. Yeah, it'll be a real, uh, you know, that's why they put the paragraph in there, to put, put everyone's mind at ease that mm -hmm. they're not uh, uh, supporting a, a general workplace atrocities by purchasing the game. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, anyways, that's, that's it for today's episode. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, we go all into the horse pill shit uh, in yesterday's episode, and we talk a lot about how... Horse paste. It's, uh, it's paste. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's apple flavored. It's delicious. <laughs> we go into that and then the talk about challenge. the crate challenge, which is still gaining traction, still blowing up. Usually, like, but our videos is like usually the, the nail in the coffin for yeah. these trends, but somehow they didn't listen. Now it's going to go all the way to Ellen before it dies. There's, Ellen's not around to. Uh, isn't she around for a little bit longer? I don't know. She's around just long enough to kill this challenge. Come on, Ellen. You got to kill all the memes. We got one last job for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's something people are having fun with. Why don't you ruin it? Anyway, we'll see you for News Dump yeah. very soon. Until then, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.